This will be our 27th lesson in Genesis. It means we're beginning our second year. <laughs> Went by kind of fast. We're going to begin the 18th chapter tonight. And God's fourth appearance to Abraham. <coughs> we'll be covering the first 15 verses. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from my servant, thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. They said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a cat, calf tender and good and gave it to a young man and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? He said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were well were, were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Then they left. Another one of those texts now that a variety of things have been said about it, so we want to be sure just to say the truth about it. Amen. Now I did want to underscore before I begin the importance of the record of Abraham. <clears throat> We're not dealing with just history here. God raised up certain people and he taught something through those people. Let me give you some three other examples. The record of Melchizedek is short, but it's necessary to the understanding of Christ. The same is true of Aaron the high priest. You got to know what he did to understand what Christ is doing. And the record of Moses, that's essential to an understanding of Christ because the law came by Moses and that's the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So, so God... It's his manner he localized certain teachings in people yeah. instead of on a page. Then the page they wrote about. Then they wrote about the people. Record of them. So the record of Abraham he is a definitive view of faith. Amen. If you wonder whether you have faith, you just lay yourself alongside Abraham. That's how you find out. If there's a big gap between you and Abraham, then you don't have faith. Yeah, amen. It's just that no polite way to say it. That's just the way it is. 
There are 259 references to Abraham in Scripture. 193 of them are from Genesis through Malachi because he's like the thread that's woven throughout the entire record. <clears throat> There's 66 of them from Matthew through Revelation. All of them relate to his life after he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, the last hundred years of his life. We don't know anything at all about the first 75 years except who his father was and who his brothers were. So what do we know exactly about Abraham? Well, it's, it's really not much that we do know about him. It's a tailored record now. Remember, this is, he no doubt his life no doubt was full of, full of activity, but the details, God penned, had the details because he's defining faith. So his objective isn't to tell you about Abraham. His objective is to teach you about faith. So he does it in Abraham. Well, we know he was called by God and he responded to it. And we know he left Ur of the Chaldees at God's word, not knowing where he was going. We know he stayed in Haran for a while. We don't know exactly how long. He accumulated possessions and servants until God moved him toward the promised land. We know he built altars to the Lord, honoring the Lord. And we know he called on the name of the Lord. And he knew what to do in a time of famine. We knew that. He knew how to handle that. And he did survive a stay in Egypt. And when the place couldn't support his flocks and Lot, they separated and he gave Lot the first choice. We know he walked through the land like God told him, examined it. We know one occasion he took 318 of his trained servants and defeated four armies of significant kings. We know he believed the promise of God, even though it contradicted human reasoning, and we know he instantly obeyed everything God told him to do. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty much the synopsis of what we know about Abraham. But those are the kind of things you need to know. If you're going to have faith defined, you have to know these kind of, you got to know these kind of things, whether a person moves when God tells them to move, and whether they give God glory by building an altar to him and then honor him, you got to know whether they obey instantly and whether they hold on to the promise once it's given, even though it, things still look like it's not going to work out. Those are things you have to know about faith. So the nature of faith is revealed in Abraham. Now, I don't know how you could explain why so little is said about Abraham in our day. There's a lot of criticism about Abraham. But given this purpose, excuse the vulgarity, but how dumb can you get to criticize the man through whom God is teaching us about faith? Amen. So what has happened? People criticize Abraham. They disarm the people. Yeah. Now they, they look at Abraham with a critical eye yeah. rather than to perceive how faith works. Because see, you, it's one thing to say, I have faith. It's another thing to have faith. That's, that's, another, that's another matter. So he doesn't leave it to your feeling or your conjecture or what you pass through a certain routine. He, he gives a living example of faith so you'll be able to test it out. Amen. From the very beginning, faith, from the very first contact with God, faith always accepts what God says without qualification. Now you just have to, you have to be a Bible reader to know this, but this is, what, this is how faith reacts. Faith never staggers. Faith never withdraws. Faith never doubts. Faith never says that can't be. Too hard. We know this is the case because it's demonstrated in Abraham. Yeah, amen. There were tests to his faith. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the test, you might question his actions, but see, he held on to, he kept the faith, yeah. and eventually ironed that out. Now, there's the same is true of God's people. You don't want to test your faith too soon, make an assessment of it too soon. You may be in the midst of a test. 
So what are you doing a test? Say, oh boy, I fail there. Whoa, that's terrible. No, you've got to pass the test. Keep the faith, keep on going through then. And at the end, you'll be like Abraham, you'll know the truth. Now I want to show here just briefly how God has raised up certain people and embodied a, a, a truth in them so you could see it in a person. Take, for instance, Noah. We see how faith is consistent, can last over a long period of time. Take Abraham. We see how faith reacts to hearing God. Moses is an example of leadership. He is faithful in all God's house. He's a person who wants to know how to be a good leader. Study Moses. Study Moses. He was a leader. Faith. God said he was faithful in all God's house. So that's the kind of leader. That's the kind of leader he was. Solomon, we have an example of the thoroughness of worldly wisdom that can be given to a man, and yet it can't save his soul. We dedicate that to people that are education hungry. And you've got an example in Paul how much of truth a person can be given to see. The abundance and the apostle John that even in old age he didn't dull his capacities and he got the greatest vision he ever got when he's almost a hundred so you see these are people in the scripture that they, they, they illustrate great kingdom truths so true faith always accepts what God says and never balks at it now let's get to our text in the first verse. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. We don't know the time reference here. It wasn't like a long many years. It wasn't too long after this appearance in chapter 17, but we don't have any idea about really how precise it was. Ordinarily, the appearances to Abraham were separated by a significant period of time. Normally, years. There were years in between, but this one here, there wasn't a real a year, maybe. There wasn't a long period of time because it's coming to the point where the promise he gave is going to be fulfilled. So the appearance kind of picks up a little bit. Faith. Uh, this tells us that faith can function well on a, on a word from God. You can give a word of him at 75, and at 85, he can still be hanging on to that rather brief word. That, this is what faith does. This is what faith does. This isn't what faith ought to do. This is what faith does. So you examine yourself to see if you're in the faith, so you get this kind of information in your spirit. Is it easy to forget what God said? Then you've got to work on faith. That's the weak link is faith. That's what the trouble is. A similar set of circumstances are found in Paul the Apostle. There weren't a whole lot of appearances to him. It was just three years he was in Arabia. How much of that was occupied by Christ teaching, we don't know. We assume most of it was, but we really don't know. He was on the road to Damascus. The Lord appeared to him. Some years passed, and he appeared to him in Corinth. Then some more years pass, and an angel Lord appeared to him during a storm. Then Paul said that the Lord re Jesus revealed the Lord's Supper to him. And the Lord told him he would bear witness to him in Rome, and that's about it. I say that's about it of the recorded appearances. And what I'm showing you here, the Word of God is powerful. So we don't live by every appearance of God. We live by every word of God. See, we don't live by every experience we have. We live by every word of God. See, it's important to, to nail that down. See, the word of God is quick and powerful. Appearances aren't. The word of God provokes you to search the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, appearances don't necessarily do this. Sometimes they produce fear. So the person is momentarily is almost thrown off guard. That's the important thing to know. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this, so they don't subject themselves to very much of the Word of God. Not knowing that they can't live with by anything else. The things of God are like vaporous. 
until they're encapsulated in his word. They're like, it gets get away from you. It's like you're trying to get a hold of a vapor. You can't, you can't do it. It gets away from you. But the word of God, it, it doesn't. And the Lord appeared to him in the plains of memory. And I, uh, we had more, one more word to what I was saying. It's a grievous sin to be perpetually ignorant of what God said. Yeah. We understand that there's a point in time when a person comes into Christ when they really don't have a, much of a working knowledge of the Word of God. But for that to continue, that's a serious sin against God. Paired them in the plains of memory. Now there's a location. Memory is mentioned ten times. You may recall this is where Abram first pitched his tent when he got in and when he left uh, when he first, first landed in Canaan and he moved then God said I'm going to give you the land and he moved from Shechem to Mamre where he pitched his tent that's where Mamre that's where he received word of the capture of Lot he was at Mamre when the messenger came and told him this is where God appeared to him in our text. This is where Abraham buried Sarah, Mamre. Abraham himself was buried here in Mamre. This is where Jacob came to Isaac shortly before Isaac died. This is where Jacob was buried in this area. So I conclude that Mamre was to Abraham what Sinai was to Moses and what the temple was to David what the house of God was to David. Uh -huh. were sanctified areas. Uh -huh. For believers, <clears throat> the assembly of the saints is like a memory yeah. with holy associations and insights. There's where in a most unique way it can be said God is in you of a truth. See, it's a unique yeah. type of circumstance. That's why when they that fear the Lord spake often one with another Heaven noted it in a book of remembrance is written. That's why, because this is like an ideal environment uh -huh. to culture spiritual appetites. Amen. I would uh, I, I would venture. I'm a little cautious, but I would venture to say that I don't believe a person could culture a good spiritual appetite without assembling, unless he had been or she had been isolated someplace by persecution. And when, they, when the Lord appeared, it was at the heat of the day. Now most people understand the heat of the day was noontime when the sun was at its highest. So you might, when the sun was at its peak, that's it, scripture talks this way about noon. There's a lot of reference to noon in the old scriptures. It was when the sun was the brightest. So when the natural day was its brightest, <laughs> Abraham gets a brighter illumination. Yeah. See, so in thy light, we see light was kind of lived out in a parable form Form there. Another parallel to that took place when Saul confronted Jesus. It was at noon. Yeah. When the sun was at its highest, when he got his highest revelation from the Lord. So we learn that this is God's manner. It's, it's demonstrated in this natural surrounding but understanding is ministered in an environment of light. That's something you got to really see. Yeah. Not in darkness or ignorance. Yeah. You can't sing down yeah. a revelation. Uh, amen. This is the way it is. Mm -hmm. There has to be a word. Yeah. Uh -huh. There has to be some kind of illumination before God will actually open anything up. And it's lived out in these... Uh, in these texts here. You know, when people, uh, when their approach to religion or whatever, however you want to state it, is rather shallow and juvenile and childish, they're not going to learn anything. Because God doesn't work. I mean, it may be a hyped up, you know, really hyped up, jumping up and down and really that kind of environment. But this, is a, this, does a, this doesn't happen to be the environment in which God illuminates people. 
Sometimes he'd like knock them down, like he did Saul of Tarsus, <laughs> or he'll frighten them, sober them up. But he he works in an environment of light. Very important to see that. There, as he was sitting by his tent during the heat of the day, where it was more comfortable and shady. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men stood by him. Now remember the text said the Lord appeared unto. So he breaks this down and says, here's how he appeared, three men. Yeah. Three men standing. Now the different versions, it says he stood by him. Some versions say the three men standing nearby. New Revised Standard said standing near him. The Revised Standard says stood in front of him. Living Bible says they were coming toward him. The Amplified Bible says they stood at a little distance from him. So I like this way it says here. They were, they were standing right, right close by him where he could see him. There he looked up. There they were. He didn't see him like coming off. Looks like three men coming down the road there. Way to, they were just there. One moment they weren't. Next moment they were. He looked up and he saw them. He didn't say, Why? what am I going to do? We're not ready for visitors today. I'm showing you how faith is. Faith is always prepared. Amen. 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 Now we gather that these were angels, angels, angelic messengers, because God himself has no, is not a, cor he is, has no corporal presentation. He has no body. For that matter, angels don't either. They appear as men. But God sends angels who speak for him in the first person. I'll give you some examples of this. Hagar, an angel appeared to her and, and spoke to her just like God did speak. Because the angel delivered verbatim what God said. Amen. He didn't say the Lord said. Men say yeah. the Lord said. Angels won't say that. Yes. They just. Anytime something filters through the human mind, you got to say the Lord said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have a qualifier on that. <laughs> Angels don't have that kind of trouble. They can hear the thing just pure, just speak it pure. Amen. So God accommodates himself to human frailty by coming in a form, otherwise, people wouldn't know he was there. See, he's here now, but a lot of people don't. They, they don't know it. They don't sense it. So we're dealing here with one of the promises of God. It was important that Abram knows who he's confronting. Remember when an angel appeared to Hagar, he talked just like us, God. An angel appeared to Manoah, and they said, we've seen God. The angel of the Lord appeared to all the children of Israel. Spoke in the first person, but it was actually it was angels doing it. God spoke to Moses in the bush, but it was the angel that yes. said it was the angel of the bush. The giving of the law was given by God. God spoke it, but then in spelling it out, it said it was spoken by angels. Uh -huh. Hebrews 2.2. 2. And Stephen said the law was given by the disposition of angels. They're actually the ones that gave it or delivered it. Paul said it was ordained by angels. See, the, God gave it, but the angels said it yeah. because God's if God was to come among us and just, we'd just die. That'd be, that'd be it. That's how much of a gulf there is between humanity and the living God, see? So angels are messengers from God, and they only deliver the word of the Lord. Just like they heard it. Now the heavenly protocol is given to us in the book of Revelation, how God, this is how God works, how God speaks to people. Here's how the book begins, the first verse of the Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And in John gave it to us. That's right. Yeah. All right. So Jesus, uh -huh. angel, John. But when John spoke it, it was just as pure as when God gave it to Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's how the word of God is. Oh, yeah. So there's somebody, he spoke to Jesus, gave it to Paul, Paul gave it to us, but it's just as pure when we got it. 
as when Paul got it, as when Jesus got it. And this is one of the reasons the exhortation is so strong to, to make sure you have sound words. That's right. You actually pass on what, what's what been revealed. That's right. And not tamper with it. Because it, if you tamper with yeah. it, it won't have the same effect or results. Amen. <laughs> Take this message to Revelation. It says God's, God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to an angel. The angel gave it to John. Now let's hear this angel delivering this. The angel delivers this to John. Listen to some of these statements he made. I will give power to my two witnesses. It's, it's an angel said that, but actually it was, it was God saying it through Jesus. Uh -huh. Behold, I come as a thief. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it was an angel. Mm -hmm. Come out of her, my people, ye be not partaker of her plagues, and ye shall receive not of her, of her sins, and be not received not of her plagues. Behold, I make all things new. As an angel said that. Yeah. Uh -huh. But he said it for God. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Well, I won't, I won't have to read the rest, but this makes my point that when an angel speaks, it's the Word of God. It's not dumbed down. It's not watered down. It's not modified. It's the pure thing. Yeah. Amen. The objective of men is to seek to do the best they can yes. when they're making an affirmation of some kind mm -hmm. to buttress it with a thus saith the Lord. Amen. And if you find you can't, then you say things like, in my opinion, or this is how I see it, or you modify it some so people don't get the idea that what you said came from God unless you can support that it did come from Amen. God right. by a statement. Now this would, of course, this would revolutionize preaching. In his letter to the Thessalonians now, Paul commended them because they received the word of God just like we're talking. He said, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard from us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Amen. So the word of God is not like magic. That's right. When we speak the word of God, it isn't that it just goes out there and works. Mm -hmm. That's not it. Mm -hmm. It only works in those who believe. Amen. Amen. Effectually works yeah. in those who believe. Uh -huh. Very important truth to see. Yeah. Now, of course, it's a very disconcerting situation on your hands when men despise the Word of God. <laughs> Knowing this, this is very serious. You say, well, why don't more churches, why don't they have the Word of God? Because the people don't want it. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't get it. They don't want it. Mm -hmm. Bad enough, what it may say that way. They're not saying, evermore, give us this bread. That's yeah. what the disciples say. Okay, we'd say, keep on talking. That's what we'd yeah. say. Uh -huh. In our time, philosophy, the philosophy of preaching has been adapted to lead people to believe that a word that offends the people should be withheld. As though God thinks about human response when he speaks. Let's see how are they going to respond to this. Now one further thing, angels as I mentioned are spirits, ministering spirits. They don't have a body or a corporal nature. Whenever they've appeared, they always appear as men. And they always speak in the language of the people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, you can't find you can't find any text in Scripture where an angel was talking with what they call the angel's tongue. Yeah, that's right. I dedicate this to those who say they speak in the heavenly language, yeah. <laughs> and I ask, how do you know? Yeah, that's right. What kind of evidence? Do you have that you're speaking in a heavenly language yeah. because the preacher said this or your creed says this because the Bible doesn't say this. That's right. So, well, if I speak with the tongue, if I speak with the tongues of angels, the same text says if I move mountains, all you people that keep that, you don't talk about moving mountains, do you? You say, I got the gift of moving mountains. <laughs> Well, they don't say that because they know good and well they can't. Yeah, that's, right. that's the same text that talks about angels' tongues. So a man, 
Angels always appeared as men, and they always spoke in men's language. Why? Because they were come from God to deliver men a message, not to impress men, to deliver yes. a word to men. So what about Paul? He, word, he heard words that were unlawful to utter. That didn't mean God said, now don't you, don't you tell anybody what you saw or heard up here. It was that there was, it was a, it couldn't be communicated. Uh -huh. Not lawful means it violated the laws of speech. That you couldn't, he couldn't tell you what he, what they said, yeah. because there wasn't a language. So he must have understood it another way. Uh -huh. When God speaks, an understanding of it is imperative. That's the point. Well, Abram sees these three men. And he leaps up and he goes out and he's hospitable to them. He said, my Lord, it's almost like he sensed what's happening here. If I found favor in thy sight, pass not away. Don't, don't, don't leave. I mean, have you ever told the Lord, don't, don't leave? Amen. Remember other people on the road to me? He said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't leave. Some people, they're anxious to leave. Hey, to get out. We've been here a long time. Uh -huh. <coughs> Don't leave. Don't yeah. pass away. Mm -hmm. I like that. Amen. This is the text that the book of Hebrews refers to. One of the incidences was that be, to, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. People, that's people you don't know. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Right. They didn't know. These are angels. They yeah. looked like men. They were, they were angels. Yeah. Lot did the same thing. These were angels that visited him, but they looked like men. He, he, he entertained them. He was hospitable to yeah. find the men. Set some food before them. <coughs> so we're going to see hospitality lived out. So it's what it's one thing to theorize about it, but not here. Lived out. Three total strangers. <coughs> Sarah come out and said, now be careful, we don't know if they're like robbers or something. Yeah. This is what how people think today. Mm -hmm. It shows you how low, you say, well, we've got to be practical. You think there weren't robbers back then? Yeah. You think back before the word of God was given, there weren't violent robbers and people like this? More than there are today. That's right. yeah. Yes, there were. There were bad people. Uh-huh. But see, he had faith. He chose him with faith. Amen. So he said, here's a stranger. I'm going to be hospitable uh -huh. to them. Now, he was aggressive. He, he was aggressive in his hospitality. First, he ran out uh -huh. to meet him. Bowed himself to the ground. Asked him not to turn away. Said he right away, said, we're fresh you with some water. Get your feet washed. Sit on rest a while. Hospitable. Lot rose up to meet his visitors, Genesis 19, 1 through 3, bowed himself to the ground, asked them to turn in, pressed upon them greatly to do so, and made them a feast and baked some bread. So that's, that's what he did. He only had two of them. Then there was a Shunammite woman, who was a great woman, very prominent woman. Prophet Elisha would pass by her house. And uh, she constrained him to come in. Come on, come on in and eat. So he passed by that place pretty often. So pretty soon he did. Eight time he went by, he stopped in to eat. Hop, we're talking about hospitality now. See. And uh, finally, this was kind of happening frequently. So she said to her husband. Didn't say her husband said to her. What did Dick, Dick do note of this? Yeah. She said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make him a little chamber. Bedroom, we'd say. I pray thee on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Hospitality. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a, that's a good, marvelous picture? To build a special room up on the, 
apartment yeah. on the wall up there. Not on the wall this way, on the wall this way. And then there was Cleopas and his companion. Jesus said he was going to make his way go further. They said, oh, 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 it's getting dark. Days far spent. Now you turn in with us. And they ate, had a meal. Hospitality. Keep in mind now, these are strangers. <laughs> Have you ever thought to yourself, I wonder how many strangers I turned down that was were angels. Someone may look here like a beggar. He'd be like a beggar sitting on the temple wall. He either said, it's just something to think about. Uh -huh. Pass not away, don't, or don't leave. Now keep this in mind, that these are angels, but they're beholding this too. They're seeing this all worked out too. I gather angels know a lot, but they're not omniscient. They know everything. I think of a word that Paul said one time about heaven monitoring the apostles. He said, I think God has set forth us, the apostles, last as, he, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and men. <laughs> a little graphic down there that what happens to holy people, how they respond and so forth, there's men looking at them, there's the world looking at them, there's godly men looking at them, world looking at them, the angels, they're watching them. I can almost hear the Father say, uh, listen up angels, take note of how my servant Abraham reacts. You remember when they left up here? You remember those angels I sent on the mission? I want you to see how Abraham reacts to them. Not to mention ourselves, snorting. snorting. You remember in the church at Corinth, they had some trouble at Corinth. There were some interruptions and disorder and so forth. And some of it was traced back to some women that were asking questions. We don't have a lot of details about it, but they asked questions during the evidently it's a prophetic utterance was being given, and they were interrupted. The prophet may have been their husband, and she asked them, or maybe they were hollered over on either side to her husband. They interrupted, uh -huh. and Paul said that uh, they, should, they shouldn't do that. He said, "Man ought to indeed cover his head. He's a subordinate. He's man should not cover his head. He's not subordinate to." other men, so to speak, for as much as he's the image of the, and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. He's talking about marriage now. He's not talking about all you women better pay attention to all us men. That's not what he's talking about. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Well, what did you bring that in there for? See, the angels are subordinates. That's right. Amen. So no, no woman or man should complain about being a subordinate because angels are subordinates. Yes, man. They're his angels. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so they look and they say, whoa, what that insubordination? What, what, what is that, Father? Would you like us to call fire down? I wonder whether he's ever had any kind of requests like that. So he told them he'd, he'd, he'd like to have something fixed for them, and they said, do as thou hast said. Okay, carry it out. Now this is sort of a picture of God's view of commitments made to him. Abraham makes a commitment. I'll, I'll get some water, we'll wash your feet, give you some rest, we'll fix some bread, I'll fix a calf, and we'll feed you. All right, that's, that's a commitment. So this is the Lord, now the Lord appearing to us. Yeah, you do what you said. Now just, just a pause briefly to say, when you make a commitment to God, do it. Yeah. Carry it out. Or if you make a commitment to the brethren, do it. Amen. Carry it out. I, you, you're probably like me. You've lived long enough to know that some people, if they say they're going to do something, you don't pay attention to it because they're not noted for doing what they say. Mm -hmm. They have noble ambitions, but they just never do anything. 
But that's not the way faith is Amen. at all. Well, Abram hasted. Well, this tells you something else. See, it tells you something else. When you're going to do something in the name of the Lord, you, you do it not hastily, but you hasten to do it. There's a difference between the two. Here's what Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal needed. It must be a measure of meal for each one of them. Make cakes upon the hearth, and Abraham ran unto the herd, fetched a kinder calf, half tender and good, and gave it to a young man, and he hasted to dress it. <laughs> Everything was pronto, as we say. Now there's a good principle for about making haste. Particularly when it comes to like the work of the Lord, get to the doing of it. Amen. Fulfill it, your vows. Hastening to do something related to the Lord is found throughout Scripture. You remember um, following the revelation that Mary would give birth to the Christ child, she went to the house of her cousin Elizabeth, quote, with haste. When the shepherds were apprised of the birth of Jesus, they came with haste. When Jesus called Zacchaeus out of the tree, he said, Make haste. Come down. Paul once hasted if it were possible for him to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. Once in warning, Paul the Lord said, Make haste. Get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive you. Peter admonished believers looking and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. See, there's a, there's a posture of Moving quickly, hastily, not delaying. This, there's different ways to put it. But this is faith is this way. Mm -hmm. This is how faith is. When yeah. Faith doesn't delay. It doesn't put off. It doesn't procrastinate. The attitude is always, that attitude is also reflected in the word instant. <laughs> when Anna saw the infant Messiah, she that instant gave thanks likewise and went out and started telling all the people. Paul said to the faithful Jews, they instantly were serving God day and night. Preach the word, be instant. In season, out of season. You should live close enough to God, there's some things you don't have to pray about. You just know what to do. Amen. Preach the word, be instant. Oh, Amen. first of all, maybe you should pray and ask, should I really talk to should I really deliver the word of the Lord? Be instant. In season, Amen. out of season. Why? Because when you got a word, it's not meant for you to sit on it. Yes. It's got to be delivered. That's right. See, that's the, that's the manner of the kingdom. There are spiritual intuitions and impulses that you have to obey them immediately. I know that a lot of people, this is why they are very slow at making progress. Is they don't they don't respond. When Peter preached at Pentecost, they either gladly received the word, or they right, right off the bat, they did something about it. They were baptized. They gladly received it, responded immediately. The eunuch responded immediately. The Philippian jailer responded immediately. Lydia responded immediately. You could just go all through. Cornelius responded immediately. Angel said, "Go send for Peter." Right off, they sent sent it for him. Yes. Don't respond immediately, then unbelief will set in. And, That's right. You know, so you got to go ahead and respond while you have that that That's right. that mm -hmm. impulse. Amen. And then the opportunity will leave too. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I was considering these things and how they're related to faith because whenever a person is able to act instantly, it's because they are convinced. Yeah. That's, That's right. That's what the Lord has to do. That's right. Whenever someone's hey. halting between two decisions or opinion, it's because they don't know. They're not convinced. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another word that you hear uh, straightway. They... Straightway, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's straightway. Yeah. yeah. That's immediately. And then there's the word immediately, too. Yeah, this this is a very comely response. Amen. See, and then we speak often about our the assembly, but in the assemblies, this kind of sensitivity should be awakened and cultured so it's easier to recognize when God is leading you. All right, there's 
the three men are there. They don't know, they don't even know so far as men concerned if, if Abram's married or not. But they said, uh, where's your wife, where's Sarah thy wife? Ah, uh, they know that. See, angels, they do, they are able to tell a lot. You never want to try and give an explanation to an angel <laughs> for, for being dilatory or slow. Where is Sarah thy wife? I don't doubt that Abraham picked up on this right away. Face like that. Oh, this is not just a normal, these aren't normal visitors here. I mean, what if a ranger knocked at your door? You had him come in, he said, uh, uh, Tony, where's, where's uh, Melissa? You'd say, whoa. Now faith would say, this must be God. Is uh -huh. Either God has sent me something or the devil has. i got to listen and weigh this thing out because uh -huh. this is not ordinary. Uh -huh. Or someone will say to you, boy, you were talking to me when you were doing that preaching and teaching. It was just like you were talking to me. Uh -huh. yeah. But you didn't, you didn't know that. Yeah. Where is Sarah, your wife? Well, he says that she's in a tent. <coughs> That's what she is. As a matter of record, Sarah, Sarah's mentioned 38 times in Scripture. And she's the only woman that has that name. And always the points made that she was Abraham's wife. She is never spoken of as an individual herself. Always Abraham's wife, Abraham's wife. And in this Messenger says, Behold, in the Abraham says, Behold, she's in the tent. He said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, Sarah, thy wife, mm -hmm. shall have a son. There's I'm interested in this phrase, according to the time of life. It's interesting phrase. When you see it, it's it's quite a blessing. Some of the other versions say, at this time next year. Some say, read in due season. Revised end version says, in the spring, or when the season comes around, about a year's time. The idea, the time of life is not the time of Sarah's life. It's a time when life begins to spring forth in the spring. So when life was going to spring forth in the spring, at that simultaneously, life would spring from the dead womb. <laughs> yeah, see, this is really good. From the dead womb of, of Sarah. Mm -hmm. It was a parallel. The time of life was a time of spring. Mm -hmm. And I, I won't do it here, but it'd be interesting. If you, you check out springtime, you'd be amazed at how many things in the Bible happened in springtime. Time when the first, first sign of life. So after a winter of barrenness, yep. About this time next year, which means it was pretty close to that time then, mm -hmm. new life would come from her. And Sarah heard it. Mm. See, they're holding this conversation. That I, he's not talking to Sarah. He's talking to Abraham. But, yeah. oh, yeah, you always want to have your ears tuned in. Amen. The thing may not be being said to you, but you want to be perk up and listen. Yes, amen. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. So he wasn't like addressing this to her. Now Abraham and I provide a little explanation, lest we forget. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Old and well stricken in years. Scripture always sets the facts before us, and when God's going to do something, the condition at the time is hopeless. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before He works, it's hopeless. Yeah. Remember, before He created the earth, He was without form and void. Yeah. It's a hopeless yeah. situation. Before He gave Adam a wife, it says there was not found yeah. a help meet for Him. See, He's not there. When Jesus gave the people bread in the wilderness, it was because Numbers 21.5 says, there was no bread. Yeah. <laughs> Join the divine manner here, see? God's not going to build on what you got. Yes. 
When he gave them water, there was no water for the people to drink. Exodus 17, 1. Throughout history, God's delivered people because there was, as Job said, none to deliver or no deliverer as it stated in Judges. So this is God's manner. She was barren, but he waited. He waited for her till she was beyond the age of childbearing because there were other barren women who had children in young age, miraculously. Rebecca and Rachel, you know. They weren't old women, they were young women, but they were barren. So, see, they'd say, well, there you are, something happened to Sarah. She, <laughs> see, there she finally had a child. Their prayers were answered, you know. You know, she was, he didn't do this until there was no hope. It was utterly impossible to have that child. Now, there's nothing to see here that nature declines. This is just the way it is. If you're not aware of it, you live long enough, you'll become <laughs> very right. acutely aware. And when it declines, 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 gets down to impossible, mm -hmm. that's when God works. Yes. Amen. <laughs> so if things aren't working out for you, hey, look up. Amen. Could be the beginning of something great. Yes. This is how God is now. This is how God is. <coughs> he works so he gets the glory. It ceased to be with her after the manner of women. Now, this is uh, Holy Spirit's conservative language. Uh, some of the versions, they, they've got to state it, come right out and state it, but it is, she has stopped having her womanly periods. That's what the New American Bible, that's what he's, that's what he's talking about. That there, uh, her natural body was in that state of decline where the, she was past childbearing mm -hmm. so she, no matter if if he quit he'd, he'd have to quicken her body for sure to have a child in other words so far as age was concerned Sarah was not in the category of childbearing no so far as like preaching and teaching is concerned a lot of you aren't in that category but see <laughs> you do it anyway mm -hmm. because this is how God is God says let's see who who's not qualified to preach <laughs> that's how God is now right. why because he gets glory that way see yeah, then, then when people with discernment see that well this had to be the Lord the Lord did that because Philip wasn't noted as a great personality that influenced people before he went down to Samaria yeah. Yeah. yes the teachings like this really way of a crushing blow to self-reliance and the wolf of teaching oh, yeah. that God helps those who help themselves. Yeah. Sometimes I think that you can get in a mindset where we're thinking, well, if I get to this level, then God will use me, as opposed to God puts me in, God puts me there. God yeah. makes me that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Sarah thinks about this. And therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now this is the text that Peter alludes to when he says, Sarah called Abram Lord. This is the text he's referring to here. Now if there had not been a divine response to this event, out of charity we would have figured she laughed like Abraham laughed. But see there's God puts a check on this and said it wasn't the same kind of laugh. Uh -huh. yeah. it wasn't a laugh of wonderment mm -hmm. or jubilance. Mm -hmm. We're told Abraham didn't stagger now the promises of God. He didn't, any temptations Abraham may have had he overcame them. And Sarah will overcome this too, incidentally. Yeah. She laughed, but now she didn't laugh out loud. Yeah. You will never hear anybody refer to someone laughing that didn't laugh out loud. Yeah. They'd laugh, in fact, they'd laugh at you and say, oh, I heard them laugh inside. They said, come on. 
she laughed within herself. Maybe she didn't think it was laughing. Hmm? Yeah. It wasn't a ha-ha laugh. Maybe she didn't think this was laughing. Mm -hmm. But the angel yeah. <laughs> was a laugh. The laugh of unbelief. Even though later, the test wasn't over yet, later she receives, by faith, she receives strength to conceive seed. So this was not like a, a long yes, type response. Uh -huh. Like Abraham, she did not laugh out loud. She laughed within herself. The heavenly messengers saw it. I wondered as I read this. I wondered. I wonder if I'd have responses that angels would interpret as a laugh, kind of doubting that such a thing could happen. Well, I'm going to give you some examples of this kind of laughter. <laughs> but the doctor said. Or how about this one? I'm just too old for that. Here's another one. I've never done that before. Or I've never been trained in that area. Or I'm just too busy. See, that would be considered laughing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Reasoning the wrong way. Uh -huh. So there's always things that are not said audibly, but they're festered inside. And if not quenched, they will produce the outward the outward laugh. Now I'm careful to say here that we're dealing with divine drawings that appear too difficult for flesh. And if at the threshold up here there was this response, we know from Scripture she worked her way th through that. That didn't stay that way, see. Now, you'd be glad if someone gave you that kind of tolerance, wouldn't you? It's, it's, boy, I'm glad they didn't judge me by my first response. Yeah, uh -huh. So we're not going to judge Sarah by her first yeah, response. Yeah, yeah. See, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be charitable to her like we'd like people to be charitable to us. Yeah. Now, if she had just stayed in that state, that'd been another case. But see, angels, they're not uh, sympathetic. They don't have empathy for people. So he's just going to be kind of cold about the whole thing, but he's, he's got his orders from the Lord. And the Lord said, not to, Abram didn't hear, Abram didn't hear her laugh. Nobody heard her laugh. She laughed in herself. So he said to Abraham, wherefore did Sarah laugh? Well, if he hadn't said that, no one would have imagined she'd laughed. Shall I have a surety bear a child with the mole? So he like, he knew what she what she was thinking. Mm -hmm. This angel knew what Sarah was thinking. Yeah, amen. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a real sober way of thinking. This passage came to mind saying, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest yeah. in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto That's the right. eyes of him with whom we have to do. Even Jesus, when people would thought certain things, he would respond to their yeah. thought. He'd say, right. Why did you think that in your heart? Yeah. And so when you think. Rather than, because when you think something, you can get in the mindset where you're thinking like, well, no one knows what I'm thinking. It's like it's just me, but knowing that this is taken note of in heaven, yeah. and he responds to what you think, that yeah. that affects the way you conduct yourself and the way you... Oh, amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're, you'll catch yourself, at least most people do, catch themselves thinking wrongly, but you kind of catch yourself and you... You adjust your you adjust your thinking, Lord. Give me grace here. I don't I don't want to go out. To will is present with me, but how to perform it? I don't know how. I don't I don't want to think this way. See. But let's say a person doesn't know that this is kind of the way things work, and so they have this thought and say, "Look at there, oh boy, oh boy, I must not be a real Christian." Uh -huh. There you are. Had this thought of all things. I'm so ashamed. But just stick with the Lord, yeah. see? And you say to the Lord, Lord, like, I confess, I did. I don't want this. I hate this. I hate yeah. vain thoughts. That's what David said to the Lord. I hate vain thoughts. Just, just tell him. And he'll, uh, if it was sinful, he'll forgive you. You, you confess it and forgive it, and he'll forgive you. Amen. So I like this charitable view. But doubt is never viewed favorably. 
in Scripture, he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Now, the gravity of doubting, now it says that Abraham didn't doubt. Strong in faith, and, and Sarah eventually received by faith received strength. So she yeah. she got through, she got past this. Yeah. So we're not going to camp out here uh -huh. as though this was a, a, a full representation of Sarah. It wasn't a full representation of Sarah. It was a pic depiction of her natural weakness, but her faith overcame it. See, uh -huh. eventually. And that way, if we're merciful, then we'll have mercy. <laughs> James said, let, not that, let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything from of the Lord. So don't, <laughs> if a person is vacillating, don't even, let them, don't even let them think they're going to get anything from the Lord. Amen. So that if you are, then that's got to be, you got to overcome that. That's the idea. It isn't that you're like condemned. That, that's not the point. The point is you got to get over that uh -huh. and move on in faith. Forgetting the things that are behind. Pressing toward the mark, see? Then he asked this telling question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now we're going to, I want to spend a little bit of time here. We're dealing here with a different kind of promise. This is not your conventional promise. This is a promise that cannot be negated or obviated. There's not the slightest chance this promise is not going to come to pass. It's an unconditional promise. I want to build on it a little bit. It was a contingent on human re response. Otherwise, how could how could God prophesy of the coming of Christ if it was conditioned on someone's response back here? So there are some promises that are not conditioned by human response. And the birth of Christ is, is one of them. Any promise related to the Savior coming into the world and the consequence of his death is in no way dependent on men. Not in any way. Dependent on men. He's a lamb slain for the foundation of the world regardless of what men thought. So it's imperative that we distinguish between conditional and unconditional promises. <coughs> All right, now let's, um, let's cite some things that didn't weren't contingent upon human response, like the creation of the worlds, as of for beginning, yeah. or the creation of humanity, or the reaction of God to the disobedience of men, or the reaction of God to global immor immorality and sin. His reaction was unconditional to us, see? What happens when a man finds grace in the eyes of the Lord? There's nothing that can change that. As in Noah. Because, remember, now, we're looking at it from the messianic seed, working your way up to Christ. There's, there's no chance that these people would foil the promise of God by being unfaithful. God's going to see to it that that doesn't happen. Amen. Or God's call of Abraham and so forth. There's a number of these texts that are in scripture and even the conditions like here's, here's some things that sound like they have a condition but there's an unconditional thing to it too he that overcometh will inherit all things I said that's a, if you you say well overcoming is a condition that is right but if you overcome you will inherit all things yeah, yeah. so there's an unconditional part of it you see in this case, with Abram and Sarah, God's choice is what sanctified the people. God chose the people, and that's, then he worked with the people, see? It didn't leave it up to them. What if God had said, well, I'm going to see if I can find someone who would work with the best we have, see if we can uh, get some people to agree with this. Well, the Savior, he wouldn't have been pinpointedly born in the fullness of time. This would, couldn't have happened. There's a fundamental flaw in the kind of reasoning 
that says nature has any kind of part at all in foundational working of God. Amen. When it comes to a foundational working, which means whatever is traced back to Christ, anything connected with Christ, not one parcel of it depends upon men Amen. and human response. So if we've got a Sarah that laughs to herself, there's got to come a point when she doesn't laugh anymore, but she receives by faith, receives strength. God's going to see to it that that happens, see. This isn't true of everybody that comes into Christ, you understand. This is true of things that depend solely on Christ. They, they can't be stopped or aborted by some human response. I think everybody can, everybody can see that. <clears throat> Well, Jesus said, all that the Father giveth me will come to me. See right. there, it's unconditional. Amen. Here's another one. This is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So if you get in that category, it's your invincible. Amen. Jesus told his disciples, if you have faith, you just say that about me, just move, it and move into the sea. Right. Say that sycamine tree he plucked up. That's the, if you have the faith, this will happen. Right. Of course, that's the big if, I understand. <laughs> he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, these promises are all within the circumference of God's will. That's why the guarantee is given. They're in that, within that. Uh -huh. If you can get within the circumference of God's will, God will give you what you want. Amen. I was thinking about that. I mean, the faith. That is not going to ask for the mountain to be moved. That's right. It's going to ask for something else. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's the only way. That's the way he could spell it out to us, so it would make us think bigger. See, some people they think too little. They think too little. Well, that's kind of a blight of mankind. Think of this word from John in First John three twenty one. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But someone over here says, nobody can keep his commandments and do the things pleasing in his sight. Well, but that, that doesn't mean anything in there. Right. Say, so you mean to tell me you can keep his commandments and do the things pleasing in his sight? Well, extend yourself to do it and it just may be God to give you power to do it. Amen. Is, that, is that possible? <laughs> Just as surely as it was possible for Abraham to get up and meet those three men and treat them hospitably, you think that was just pure old nature that did that? He was in the heart of God's will. He didn't even know he was confronting the Lord at first. Well, Sarah overheard this and she said, oh, I, she denied, she, I, I laughed night. Well, she didn't laugh out loud. Maybe she really didn't think she laughed. Maybe she wasn't thinking that she laughed within herself. This was a divine assessment of, right. of her attitude. She was afraid. So some text says, Sarah was afraid, so she lied. I, I don't, I like the one she denied. I like that better. So she no doubt equated laughing with the audible, just like you would. Yeah, that's right. But the Lord, he saw it differently, and he said it just that way. The weight of the question provoked fear in Sarah. Oh, why did you laugh? That when the, when the Word of God searches out the thoughts and intents of the heart, it does have a sobering effect on you, I tell you. You are not giddy-headed and laughing and giggling. Not when something like that happens. It sobers you up right away. Sarah is only the second person in Scripture of whom it was said they were afraid. The first one was Adam. And there's a couple thousand years that passed. <laughs> from Adam to, to Sarah. She's the next person that it is written she was afraid. Some years after that, it is written that Lot feared to dwell in Zoar. He said, I'm afraid to dwell in Zoar. 
Jacob was afraid after he dreamed of ladders set up on earth that reached into heaven. And Joseph acknowledged to his brethren, I fear God. But it might surprise you to know there's not a lot about fearing God in Genesis. Not many people did. Sometimes God would say, fear not. And most of the references are him saying that. The word fear is mentioned 14 times in Genesis, that's all. Seven of those times, it's not speaking of fearing before God. It's like feared what man would do, feared what Abimelech would do. It was that fear what Esau would do. Two of the times, God says fear not. The first statement in the Bible of someone fearing God is found in Exodus. And it's those midwives. <laughs> Talk about the first mention now. It says the midwives feared God. Now centuries pass, and the next mention we have of it is Nehemiah's brother Hanani feared God. That's about a long time, hundreds of years afterward. In all of Genesis, Joseph is the only man who said, I fear God. It's the only one. Hebrews 11.7 says that Noah was moved with fear, prepared an ark. Even the word afraid is only mentioned nine times in Genesis. Four of those times the fear was not toward God. In our text it does not say Sarah feared the Lord. It says Sarah feared. Now I want to make a point out of all this. <clears throat> There was not a lot of consciousness about God. In other words, man hadn't been brought to the point where fearing God was even possible unless he was confronted with some kind of a visible, yeah. knowing, knowledgeable confrontation of God. There wasn't enough known about God to fear God. Uh -huh. yeah. See? He hadn't revealed enough of him now of himself. Now, the scriptures tell us that people learn to fear. Now this is several times in scripture. I'm going to go over this. They learn to fear God. Here's what God told Moses to gather Israel together and he would make them hear his words that they may learn to fear me. Deuteronomy 4.10. Now outlining some of the fears that were, to, some of the uh, feasts that were to be observed and the procedures involved. He said that observe these feasts where I at the place I name that thou mayest learn to fear the, thy God always yeah. and Moses told the people when they when they set a king over them and this is this is a long time before Saul mm -hmm. when they set a king over them he is to read the book of the law all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. That's Deuteronomy 17, 19. Moses instructed, was instructed to tell the people when they gathered together at the Feast of the Tabernacles that they were to hear the words of the law that they may learn and fear the Lord your God. <laughs> it's good stuff, isn't it? Yeah, Initially, the, the reading was to be before the children. Deuteronomy 31, which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. So read it to the children. See, God's not satisfied with people just quaking. He wants them to learn. If you know, if you know the truth about God now, it'll promote a healthy fear of Him. If you know the truth about Him. The aim is to fear God without having to be jarred awake. So if God speaks to you, you move right away. So it's a fear that's learned primarily from his word. That's what he taught. Read the word, they learn to fear. He kept going over that. Read the word, learn to fear. If men will subject themselves to the word of God, if they'll do this, they'll learn to fear. Amen. That's what will happen. Now we're living in a generation of which it can be said, as Psalm 36, 1 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Why isn't there? It's a famine of hearing the word of God. Amen. See? Perfectly matches the situation. Yeah. 
Learn to fear the Lord. So that's the appointed means, the Word of God. brings you to learn to fear. So as Sarah was exposed more to the Word of God, she learned to fear too. God, instead of just being afraid. Nay, I, she denied, but the, the angel replies. He said, Nay, <laughs> thou didst laugh. You did too. You laughed. Nobody heard me. You did laugh. Why did me? You did laugh. You get a picture of the day of judgment here, see? Yeah. This is how the day of judgment is going to be. People yeah. say, when did we see you? You did neglect me. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah? <laughs> so the messenger saw more than Sarah saw. That's one reason why this whole thing was suddenly broken off. He just, that's it. The messenger, you know, angels aren't noted for being tolerant and long-suffering and all this sort of thing. So we learn from Scripture this was not a continued response. She did come to have faith to receive seed, to conceive seed. So the stage now is uh, being set for the development of this nation in a special land so that when the Messiah comes the environment is conducive to him learning whether anybody else did or not. He'd learn, he'd pick up on it by the time of 12, he'd be there communicating with the doctors of the law, you know. There had to be a land and a people and a culture in which that could happen. Amen. And that's what's being developed here. That's why it wasn't left up to men to respond and create this. This is what was going to happen. And it's just a matter of God, who God chose. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, in 14 times in 11 verses, in the chapters 12 through 18 of Genesis, the word covenant is used. Kind of a new word. He made a covenant with Noah, but it was a covenant not to destroy the world with water. <clears throat> the Lord made a covenant with Abram. God made his covenant between himself and Abram to increase him. God's covenant involved Abraham being the father of many nations and so forth. Now an eternal purpose is being set in, set in motion. Why is God doing it this way? Because now it becomes observable. Right? Now you can look at this. You can reason on it. You can assess it. You can see, oh, there's God working there. There's God working there. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of reaction God wants. But there has to be like an extended process for this to happen. He could thunder down on Sinai and scare everybody half to death, and then in less than one, in about a month's time, it wore off an air worship and a calf. See, yeah, right. so you can't live on just being jarred awake all the time and woke up by an accident or woke up by a tornado. That may be a beginning sometimes, but you you got to be sensitive. You have to learn yeah. to fear the Lord. Yeah. Now here's some things that had to happen before Jesus could come into the world. Like the human race had to be preserved even though it was aggravating God. Oh, ponder that. He destroyed it because they imagined if the heart was only evil continually and as soon as the flood passed, God said the condition still exists. I'm not going to destroy the earth again by water because the imagination of the human heart is evil continually. So now to preserve the human race, I taste God to do this. Nobody but God could do this, brethren. An angel couldn't do this. That's right. He had to make the character of God known. Before he's going to save men, people had to have some kind of idea what God was like. Yeah. What he hated, what he loved, how gracious he was, what his wrath was. This all had to be demonstrated, see, over a period of time. He had to make the nature of sin known. He had to acquaint men with their adversaries, so they got kind of found out what he was like, and they had to confirm the temporality of the earth, because it looks like the earth like is eternal. Yeah. Uh -huh. It just looks like it's never going to pass away, but it is going to pass yeah. away. He had to develop a concept of divine wrath. Nobody had this. They didn't know this. Well, the concept of a sovereign God, the Almighty, 
who does what he wants when he wants and nobody can restrain him or say what doest thou. That had to be developed, see. He had to define sin by a law. He had to define faith in a person. He had to develop a sense of the need of righteousness. See, men had to... He had to choose a messianic progenitor, someone to maintain this, well, all these billions of people. There had to be a line led to Jesus. And a divinely cultured nation had to be developed. And a sanctified environment, a land had to be developed. And men had to be aware of their need for a savior. And then there had to be an anticipation of the savior developed. And the concept of a token of a covenant, something that told you you were part of the covenant. See, those are just things off the top of my head, but that all had to be done before Jesus could come. Yeah. Yeah. And what we're seeing, and we're seeing it start back here in uh -huh. Genesis, got down to business, you might say. With Abraham, the thing got down to business. Everything else is like breaking up the fallow ground, yeah. getting ready to start, but now, it's, now the thing's underway now. And that when you keep this in mind, you plot through Genesis and all the rest of the old scriptures, and you keep this in mind, then when you get, you're glad when Jesus appears. Ah, that's, that's what we've been waiting for right there. Amen. Needful preparations. All right, I think I'll conclude there. I surely did get a lot out of this. I, I hope I was... Uh, didn't gobble it up for you, but this thing about the unconditional promises, that, that just nourished my soul. That there just are some things that don't have conditions attached to them. In the fullness of the time, Christ, he was made of a woman, made under the law, and there was, that was cast in stone before the world was born. No way could that be uh, obviated. And that, that, those are the things that build your faith, see. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the difference between law and grace. Mm -hmm. Grace capitalizes on what God does. Law capitalizes on what you do. And while the law is true and righteous and holy, it doesn't promote con confidence and assurance because it's based on what you do, yeah. not on what God does. Amen. Yeah. All right, we're open. Any of you have something you'd like to add? Been kind of quiet tonight, brethren. And this matter of um, God waiting till they were old and well stricken, <laughs> yeah. and then and then observing that she laughed. See, this it, there's a sense in which that this this it, it doesn't make sense to flesh that God can do these things. That's it's right. impossible. That's right. And so it, I can see as you were speaking that that there's been times in my life when and it, and, and I didn't even know I was. I didn't even know I was in unbelief. I just thought, well, I got to be reasonable here. That's right. But see, the thing is, is that if God said something about it, that's, right. that's the reasonable thing. That's the reasonable. That God's going to do it, not me. That's the point. It's a reasonable service. It's a reasonable service. <laughs> so if you, lay, you take up your cross, well, you take it up because He said to do it. That means there's grace to do it. Yeah. They say, well, wait, I'm tired. Take it up anyway, yeah. because it's not up. It's not like you're you're never going to be strong enough to take up your cross. Yeah. But but he's always going to give you grace if you'll reach out. Like the the man, you know that, that he couldn't walk. He couldn't walk. He was laid on his bed. Take up your bed and walk. Yeah, pick it up. How did he get the strength? He made the effort to do That's it. That's right. And he got the strength. Same That's thing. He get the strength. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Now. Uh, the the uh, the angels came to visit Abraham. It was a lot for Sarah too. Oh yes, <laughs> because they had to they had to Amen. they had to get her thinking right. That's right. Uh, they came to uh, to confirm the promises with Abraham, yep. but they also came to to minister to Sarah. Amen. She's got, See, there hadn't been a lot ministered to Sarah. That's so right. Yeah. We need to get her ready. That's yes, right. She's going to be, be next year. You next know. year. <laughs> So they, but she didn't do that no more. She That's didn't laugh right. again. Amen. So yes. Amen. Amen. So yeah, really good. I was thinking along the same lines as that is uh, how the Lord straightened that out. Today we live in a time where people they they call it hate, even hate if you try to straighten them out when it comes to the Lord. Yeah. They'll say, "What? That, that's his hate talk." What? And, and but see, this is this is the way the Lord works. Before we continue on in this on this path that starts off small but gets big, 
puts the end to it. I like where you, um, how you're talking about the angel here, where it's, you said, we're not for strict obedience to the Lord and to carry out the mission. No doubt many people would have their lives abruptly terminated. <laughs> and I, I was thinking about how these angels are learning from the Lord to see how yeah. he's long-suffering. I mean, there's all Amen. kinds of aspects Amen. of the Lord that the angels are watching and learning because That's right. I could just imagine if they were allowed to today, they would just put it into a lot of this right. nonsense. See that long-suffering, mm -hmm. kindness, yes. grace? Mm -hmm. These are yes. traits that there no angels ever known. Yeah. Yeah. All the angels that fell, that was it. Yeah. They didn't get any mercy or any yeah. kindness. So they're seeing it. Brother yeah. I was thinking about when you were speaking of Abraham hasting to prepare things for the three men that appeared to him. And you mentioned the synonyms of haste, yeah. the instant, and immediately. Mm -hmm. I thought in, in hasting to do something, you show a lack of doubt in doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because if you... If you are reluctant to do something, it shows that you're not sure if that's right. you're mm -hmm. if you're not sure if you want to do this or not. That's right. This instantly hasting to do things shows no doubt or reluctance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It puts a new, a fresh view on hastening, un hastening under the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. we're running to meet Him. Is the yeah. idea. That's right. <laughs> yes, I also, I also enjoyed that. Um, smaller point that you made on that same issue of it not being hasty. Yeah. There's a difference between hastening to do the yeah, work and being right. hasty yeah, in right. the work because Abraham was very thoughtful and careful in all these things that he did and he planned but he set to do it immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he developed a culture in his household. He told yeah. that young man, fix this right away, told him to fix this right away. Uh -huh. So he developed this kind of a in, in, in environment. Yeah, that's right. Would it be like us throwing together something in the kitchen yes, today? Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably given. Oh, yeah, Sister Nick. I was going to wait. Um, I was also considering this hastening, and I liked how you brought that out. Um, my mind immediately went to David when he was facing Goliath. Oh, yes, David. And how he Grand. didn't consider his own self. In a, in his opponent compared to himself, he hastened that's to right. the field, and um, and because he knew the Lord was with him, Amen. That's why he hastened, and the purpose of it was so that David would prevail over the Philistine. And I was thinking about that with this um, when the angels told him, "Okay, you know, go do what you said you were going to do." And so they didn't drag their feet; they they hurried up yeah. and did it, and then. It was it was so that they could get the word after that. Um, the angels were going to deliver that word. So we want to, um, I, I, I do like how you brought out that it wasn't done um, not carefully. It's like when we know the Lord's with us, we do what he wants us to do and receive the blessing after. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Did you have something to say? Yeah, I was thankful too for um, the way you brought out Sarah and her response and um, how how you see faith lived out in real life yeah. in, in her mm -hmm. and how um, in the beginning you spoke about how faith um, is built upon hearing what God said, yeah. his, his word, and that's how faith comes. And faith is also easily corrected mm -hmm. when it Good. needs to be corrected, Good. when mm -hmm. the word of the Lord is spoken. And I was thankful that um, I've heard a lot of people say horrible things about Sarah concerning this situation, but mm -hmm. she never wavered again. She was she yeah. received strength yeah. to Amen. conceive, and and so we see this is how faith responds. You know, there may be some times where maybe we're wavering, and the Lord sends a word, mm -hmm. and and it's it's His way of, of bringing us back to to where He Amen. wants us to be. Amen. Mm -hmm. I was thinking along these same lines too, is um, 
like you said, the the the, the trial's not over until the end of the yes, you know, right. mm -hmm. So just like this with Sarah, her faith was strengthened. She needed this right. strength. Amen. So so the Lord is faithful to strengthen our faith so that we can believe. Amen. I mean, we can believe the things that that people think that you know they think mm -hmm. with their hope and against hope. Yeah. We can believe those things because the Lord mm -hmm. will strengthen that faith so that we can we are able. Amen. We, Amen. we are well able to go yes. up and take Amen. the country. Yeah. Everything we know about Abraham had to do with his faith. Yes. Right? All the events. Yeah. And that's heaven's perspective. Amen. Now when it's all over with, everything that's going to be of any value is how we responded yeah, that's right. in life. Whether we've responded by faith or not. That's, that's what right. heaven's in, interested in seeing. All the other yeah. incidentals, is, it's not important. It's how did we respond in faith or not. Yeah. Abraham. Yeah. Well, don't you, Brother Tony, sometimes mar at least I marvel, I do. Did I miss this before? <laughs> it's what you see, and it's just so sort of plain, you know. And you think, wow, that's because we were dominated by a th system of theology, and the system shut all these things up because a system... Is, is fixed, but a faith life is always in a constant state of flux. It's like increasing, growing, reaching further, seeing where it's not. So that's why salvation can't be by law. See, that's, that's why, because law is like yeah. fixed. Yeah. There's no growth. Yeah. Nothing like that allowed under law. Yeah. Yeah. Now, imagine how it would have neutered the whole thing of the angel would have said, yeah, what I know. We just can't help ourselves. We all laugh. Yeah. But see, this is what's being said out there today. It's just like, yeah. we were talking about that on the way here. That, that it, it will, Even when a person says something that you think this is going to be good, then it's like at the end, they just I neuter know. the whole thing. They cut it off and say, well, but, you know. Now we, we are. are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're human. But well, we yeah. are, but that's not all we are. That's not all we are. Amen. Well, you know, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I was thinking about this matter of Sarah laughing with inner self and God break bringing that to the surface. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like more toward the end of judgment, like every idle word, every yeah. idle thought being brought to the surface. Now, this is just one instance of one thing being brought up, but when Jesus, he said, you'll give account for every idle word Amen. you ever said. So like everything you whispered, everything you said under your breath, even every thought you had, you're going to, everyone, before everybody. Oh, yeah. It's not like it's a personal thing where no one knows. Everyone's going to know. So, with that in mind, I mean that whatever you thought that may be flawed, you want to settle that now. <laughs> Amen. Whispered in the ear, shouted from the housetop. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're being given provision now for that because, like, just like at the meetings, I mean, I, I know I can speak for myself. Maybe I've laughed in myself and said, you know, and, and I said, no, I didn't. And the Lord said, yes, you did. <laughs> nah, yeah. but I didn't laugh. You know, so there's things that we that we, we increase in That's here right. That's so that right. we, can be, we can get that. I straight. think the angel probably restrained himself quite a bit at that point. <laughs> Sarah had to be worked out in, yes. order, right. in order for the purpose to, yes. to be brought about. Amen. That's how God did it. That's right. So when, when God, when there's this thing that there's no leeway, it's not conditional, then God knows how to bring men to the point where they choose the good. I could take uh, Jonah. God knew how to bring him to make a right choice. Yeah. That's right. Because <laughs> this had to go. See, yeah. Because this is going to be a type yeah. of Christ. Uh -huh. Remember? Yeah. So he, so this had to happen. So, But this is how he did. He didn't just like knock him out. He sent him down. He just reigns the circumstances yeah. so he got to thinking a little clearer. Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Some folks have to be dealt with a little differently. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brother yes, Sister, I was Hill. considering how in the dealings with Sarah and the angel how it's a it's a picture of how the Lord deals with us now how he reveals to us the thoughts and intents of our own hearts that yeah. we might not even know are there yeah. because of yeah. the working that he has for us to do mm -hmm. how it, 14 years before this she and Abraham believed that she was going to be the one to bear this this child and in a sense she probably still thought that she believed that but there was this one little spot that of doubt that was still there that the Lord had to show her that she had so that she could 
be able to, yeah. to do the work that he had for her to do. Amen. 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 Yeah. So yes. It is the manner of the Lord to put in check your thoughts. When a person is drawing near to God, they are very conscientious of how their mind thinks. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So that can be a good evidence for all of us if you're if you find yourself more concerned about the way you're thinking, mm -hmm. then the Lord is near. Yeah, the Lord good. Is near. Yeah. It's like a revelation. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this record. We thank you for Abraham and Sarah. What noble examples they are of the triumph of faith. And we want to follow in their train, so to speak, and give glory to you by our faith increasing, by any doubts being dissolved. We know that uh, in Daniel's day you were known as a dissolver of doubts. And how wise you are in doing this. We thank you for working with us in Jesus' name. Amen.